MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. Today we're going to talk about the treatment of asthma and COPD. And while the treatment of COPD, particularly with this, is not changing, there's been a radical change with asthma treatment. And that is reflected in the new guidelines that are put forth for the treatment of asthma. So let's talk a little bit about this first. What we're seeing here is a representation of the pharmacological treatment of both asthma and COPD. And what it's showing here is that here in the old paradigm, and indeed it's still the same for COPD, is that all patients are put on a short-acting beta agonist. A beta agonist is going to accelerate the dilation of the bronchus and allow that to happen on a short-acting basis. And then, for instance, in COPD, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist is added. And if that is not sufficient, then added to that is a long-acting beta agonist. And then finally, an inhaled corticosteroid. And those are the maintenance. So these boxes here in the upper portion of the picture are maintenance. That means that they're taking it every day, regardless of how well or bad they are breathing. And then they're using the short-acting beta agonist for relief in these situations. And that really isn't going to change, at least in today's video, COPD is the same. But when we're talking about asthma, it's the reverse. That was the old paradigm. Let's talk about what it was, what it used to be. So what it used to be is that patients with asthma that had intermittent asthma could be treated on a short-acting beta agonist. That would be like albuterol or Ventolin, and they would take two puffs as necessary up to four to six times a day. And then if it was persistent or if they started to develop symptoms more than twice per week or their albuterol inhaler more than twice per week or they were using it at night more than once per month, these are all signs of basically not being controlled with their asthma. Then they would add as a maintenance. First, they would add an inhaled corticosteroid. Then if that didn't work, they would add a long-acting beta agonist. And if that wasn't sufficient, they would add a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. So these are all three different classes of inhalers. And so it's not uncommon to have some asthmatics on two different inhalers or even three different inhalers. So this is the old paradigm. But there's been some research in the last two to three years that has really thrown that on end about what's the best approach. That evidence has led to a change in the guidelines. Just to be clear, what we're saying here is that it's very possible for people with asthma that is persistent to take a short-acting beta agonist by itself when they needed relief, but to continue taking a combination of an inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting beta agonist together as routine treatment, or even taking an inhaled corticosteroid by itself as routine treatment twice a day, for instance, or once a day, and then to use a short-acting beta agonist when they needed it. Let's take a look at some of this data. Here was an article that was published back in 2019 in the New England Journal of Medicine titled Controlled Trial of Budesonide Fomoterol as Needed for Mild Asthma. And this was a 52-week randomized open-label parallel group controlled trial involving adults with mild asthma. And they were randomized to one of three different treatment groups. And you'll be able to recognize these as some of the old paradigm. We had an albuterol group, which used albuterol only as needed when they had asthma symptoms. This is mild asthma. Then they had a budesonide maintenance group. So these are people that were put on budesonide, which is an inhaled corticosteroid, routinely as a maintenance, and then used albuterol as necessary when they had symptoms. Then there was a third group. And the third group is what's interesting. This was a group that combined budesonide and fomoterol, which, by the way, is both a long-acting and a short-acting beta agonist. And that's kind of interesting for a long time in the United States because the studies weren't done. The FDA refused to label fomoterol as a short-acting beta agonist. It only could be given as a long-acting beta agonist. But it has now, in the United States, been given that recommendation that it can be used as a short-acting beta agonist. And so what they did in this trial is they combined an inhaled corticosteroid and a short-acting slash long-acting beta agonist and said, just use that as needed. And so every single time the patient had an exacerbation, they would use budesonide and fomoterol and nothing else. So there was no maintenance in this group. This is kind of an interesting group. No maintenance inhaled corticosteroid. So they were able to look at this with electronic monitoring and see exactly how people were using it. Let's see the results of this study. One of the endpoints was the number of times an exacerbation criteria were met. And here are our three groups again, the albuterol only, PRN, 
the maintenance group with budesonide and the PRN group with budesonide and famoterol. And what you notice here, first off, is high use episodes were very high. In fact, all of these episodes were very high with just the albuterol group. So they didn't like that. So albuterol alone with no maintenance for mild asthma was performing very poorly. Now you may not be able to see this very well, but the 10 here and the 25 goes up to about here. And so what we're looking at is high use episodes. If we compare the budesonide maintenance group, budesonide twice a day, and then albuterol as needed versus budesonide and fomoterol only as needed, you can see that while there was a few more high use episodes with this last group, Clearly, the urgent medical care usage and the course of systemic glucocorticoids like prednisone went down considerably. If we look across the board, we can see that there were some other categories where this last group was superior. Here we see no difference between the annualized exacerbation rates between this last budesonide fomoterol group and the budesonide maintenance group. But together, both of these were better than just the albuterol group alone. But if we look at the very important category of the number of severe exacerbations, these are the things that could kill people. Notice that there wasn't much difference at all between those that just took albuterol all the time and those that actually were put on budesonide for maintenance. So this right here is the old paradigm standard of care. This here is the new paradigm, which is stating that having patients use as a rescue inhaler something that has an inhaled corticosteroid in it is the right way to go. Here, we're looking at exhaled nitric oxide, which is a surrogate for inflammation. And what you notice here, once again, budesonide from moderol group, which is the blue group, was low and lower than the albuterol group. Here's another study that was published in the Cochrane Library titled Combination Fixed Dose Beta Agonist and Steroid Inhaler as Required for Adults or Children with Mild Asthma. And what they found here is that compared to as required FABA alone, this is another way of saying SABA, so the short-acting beta agonist, this is a fast-acting beta agonist. So just that alone, just the albuterol, as required combination, this would be the inhaled corticosteroid and famoterol, reduced exacerbations requiring systemic steroids by 55%. If we look at that Cochrane Library, we can see here that the budesonide fumoterol had the category with the highest probability of no exacerbation. So in other words, it's good to be high here. So, of course, this data led the experts to come up with a new recommendation in 2022. So this is a global initiative for asthma, otherwise known as GINA. This is the update. And notice here what they are now saying. Whereas before, we had just a SABA for rescue therapy, and then if it was persistent, we would add inhaled corticosteroid first, then LABA, and then LAMA. Notice what's going on here in this situation. They're saying that the reliever for the controlled and the preferred reliever now is not just a short-acting beta agonist, like formoterol, but in fact, they're adding inhaled corticosteroids to it. So the rescue inhaler in asthma, according to the new guidelines, should not just be Ventolin or Albuterol. It should be a combination of a fast-acting Albuterol, or Fomoterol in this case, and inhaled corticosteroid. And there are commercially available inhalers that combine the ICS and the Fomoterol. Here are steps one and two in terms of treatment. As needed, low-dose ICS Fomoterol. If it starts to become persistent, then using it on a routine basis, increasing the dose, and then finally adding the LAMA. As we talked before, you can see here that we're adding the LAMA at the end. An alternative reliever, let's say you have a patient who has the albuterol inhaler. What they're saying here is take that short-acting beta agonist, like albuterol or ventolin or whatever it is that you have, but remember now that when you have a hit of that albuterol, take an inhaled corticosteroid with it whenever you have that short-acting beta agonist. And then a step two would be to add low-dose maintenance inhaled corticosteroid to that. But again, whenever you have a situation where you are needing to take a hit of that rescue inhaler, adding an inhaled corticosteroid is the key. Adding a low-dose maintenance ICS LABA, medium-dose ICS LABA, it's the same, and then finally adding a LAMA, as we've just talked about here in this situation. What's the difference? 
Here, this is the old paradigm for asthma treatment, which was just monotherapy with a SABA for rescue therapy, then adding for maintenance an inhaled corticosteroid if that doesn't hold it, then adding a LABA if that doesn't hold it, then adding a LAMA if that doesn't hold it. Here's the new paradigm. ICS for moderal, or an alternative could be an ICS and albuterol as a rescue inhaler. Most people have albuterol. They would need to add an ICS to that. A lot of people aren't going to remember that. So it might be beneficial or preferable to get a rescue inhaler with both of these in it. And then, of course, using it more routinely if that doesn't work. And then finally, adding the LAMA. I just want to review for you what controlled and not controlled means. Let's say that you're having exacerbations more than two times per week for which you have to use a short-acting beta agonist. And now, according to the guidelines, an inhaled corticosteroid along with it, you're going to be checking at least two here. And then if you have any night wakening due to asthma, that's three, you're already going to be in the uncontrolled category. Let's just say that you don't have any of these. Let's say you say no for all of these. There are still some things that we know that could put you at risk for flare-ups and asthma. Those are high SABA use, other medical conditions like obesity, gastroesophageal reflux disease, food allergies, smoking, e-cigarettes, psychological associated economic problems, and you can read the rest here. So these are all risk factors. Even if you don't have any symptoms, these are risk factors that increases the risk of exacerbations, and you should be aware of that. Another thing that comes up is people who have asthma and COPD. How do you treat those? With COPD, we're going to be starting from this side and working this way. And with asthma, we're going to be starting from this side and working this way. We've said that in asthma, it's extremely important to have ICS. But in COPD, as you can see here, that's one of the last things we would add. So also published with Gina was this chart here. If you've got patients looking like they have asthma, treat them as asthma. If they have symptoms that look highly likely to be COPD, treat as COPD. But because the inhaled corticosteroid is so important to have in asthma, what they are saying now is that if there are features of both asthma and COPD, treat it as if it were asthma. And the reason is we want to have ICS containing treatment, which is essential. And that's important to understand because we want to always make sure that we have the inhaled corticosteroid on if there's any sort of asthma. Notice that if we're starting with COPD, we're going to be putting on a LAMA and a LABA potentially without an inhaled corticosteroid. And that's not what we want to do if we're treating for both asthma and COPD because we need to have an inhaled corticosteroid on if we're treating asthma. And this is important here. Do not give a LABA and or a LAMA without an inhaled corticosteroid. So again, if you're looking at asthma and COPD, treat as asthma. I hope this update's been helpful. It looks as though based on the data that it should reduce the incidence of severe exacerbations in asthma, and that's a good thing. If you want more information about asthma, don't forget to join us at medcram.com.